So today's session uh, will begin very shortly. Uh, a little bit about uh, John Orlando, who has a PhD and is Associate Director of Faculty Support and Professor at North Central University. You can read a little more about him right there in the slide. Uh, he has published over 50 articles, you might look him up online, and delivered over 40 presentations, including workshops and keynote addresses on online education, which is exactly what uh, these sessions are about. So John, I think I'm going to grab you for uh, Moodle MOOC 8 and maybe uh, some other online conferences. Uh, he's been teaching with technology and um, is also an expert on social media. Uh, he's uh, created and taught a number of uh, courses for faculty on education techniques at various colleges and universities, I presume in North America or specifically the United States. And he also edits the online classroom newsletter. For those of you who haven't heard about it, uh, John, you might want to uh, give us a little bit of uh, a feedback on that. So I'm going to uh, get the presentation and let John continue. So it's, there's John's image and there's John in real life. So John, I'm going to put myself in the background and let you continue. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And thank you, John, for uh, being here with us. The first one is, could you show the lecture one? Oh, good, we're seeing it. OK. This, it, it doesn't have sound, but um, you won't be able to hear anyways. This is produced by, uh, I think it's called Open on MIT. It was a big, big thing when it came out. We're going to deliver MIT education to everyone. So you really couldn't hear, because he wasn't talking to the audience. People stand up in front of the class. You get questions, no one can hear. So, but this was part of the big, big vaulted, vaulted uh, MIT online. Okay, so that's number one. That's the first educational video. Second educational video I'd like you to play is the PowerPoint one. Okay, there you go. This is uh, part of the class content that is in a uh, university I worked at, part of the online class content. It doesn't have any sound, by the way. So this is produced by a publisher, OK? So the university bought this content as part of a class. This is produced by an educational publisher. And it's part of the class content. So I want to make sure, make sure you pay attention, because you need to know this stuff, right? You're going to be tested on it when you're done, OK? So Everyone's going to know it when we're on, right? Again, there's no sound here. So uh, you don't have to worry about sound. Give it another 20 or 30 seconds here. Actually, you've probably seen about enough. You can stop that now. So that's our second example of educational uh, videos, both used in higher education. The third one I'd like you to take a look at now I have to look over because I'm using their computer now. It's called The Door to Hell. Okay, can you show the third video? This is the third example of an educational video. Okay? I don't want to get too bogged down in the etymology, but if you're going to name a place The Door to Hell, it had better look something like this. In this case, I think we can all agree the name fits. <laughs> The door to hell, otherwise known as the Darvaza gas crater, isn't exactly a natural phenomenon. Nature merely provided the raw materials for what humans managed to turn into a decades-long environmental freak show. And while its origin is somewhat shrouded in mystery, the science behind it is not. It was 1971 when a group of Soviet petroleum geologists set out to explore the Karakum Desert in Turkmenistan. Mostly, they were looking for oil fields, but the region is also rich in natural gas, because oil and gas are both 
both the results of the same geologic process, the very slow, very intense compression of ancient organic material over time. Though there has never been an official report about the events that followed, most believe that during the initial exploration of the area, the geologists were so encouraged by their estimates of how much natural gas there was that they quickly set up some drilling rigs. But unbeknownst to them, they drilled right over a big cavernous pocket of natural gas and it collapsed soon after the operation began. The ground gave way, taking with it their equipment and creating an enormous sinkhole more than 60 meters in diameter and 20 meters deep. Miraculously, no one is reported to have been killed, but there was another problem, natural gas. It's composed primarily of methane, a colorless, odorless gas that, while not toxic, can displace oxygen and easily make it hard to breathe when it's nearby. And then there's that thing that we like so much about methane in the first place, it loves to explode. It can create a combustible mixture in the air at levels as low as 5%. Plus, even though we had yet to pick up on the fact of global warming back then, it's worth pointing out that methane is a greenhouse gas 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide. That's why in some oil and gas drilling operations where natural gas is released, if it can't be captured, it's just burned off in a process called flaring. Yes, this still releases tons of CO2, but CO2 is way less bad than methane. Anyway, those 70s Soviet scientists were left with a choice. One, continue to let the dangerous methane vent into the atmosphere, putting the local population and environment at risk, or two, light the crater on fire, burning off all the gas in what scientists predicted would take a few weeks. They chose the latter, and 42 years later, the crater is still burning. Today, the door to hell has become something of a tourist attraction, creating an eerie glow that can be seen at night from kilometers away and releasing a terrible, eggy smell that has nothing to do with natural gas, which, remember, has no smell. So, those are three educational videos. Now, there's a few points I want to make about these. The first two were both used in the class. Students were tested on those. Now, your educators, your professionals, your teachers, what are the chances that you would do well on a test on either of those first two? My guess is zero. The third one wasn't made for a class. The third one was made in the private sector. And if I asked you to tell me what was in the third video, you'd be able to do it. So that's the first lesson. And I'm going to be blunt, the best educational video is being made outside of higher education. And that's an important lesson because it leads to our second point is that if you want to make good educational video, you have to go to the experts. And this is a general lesson that involves anything you want to get good at. Simple rule of life. You want to get good at something, find someone else who's good at it, and do what they do. And that's what today's talk is going to be about. It's going to be about how to make great educational videos by taking a look at what the experts do, the people who know how to make educational videos. And all you have to do is copy what they do, and you're going to make exceptionally good educational videos. And I'll show you the techniques that they use to make videos. I have to advance the PowerPoint here. The important thing, though, to keep in mind is this. There's a reason why those two first two were such terrible failures. And that has to do with the fact that there is a common error that, all new, that everyone uh, uh, engages in when a new technology comes out. And that error is using the new technology under the old paradigm. And let me give you an example. When television first came out, the dominant media was radio. Families sat around the radio listening to these shows, kind of like Prairie Home Companion. And in these shows, they'd go through stories. And when they needed a horse coming out, they take a couple coconuts and knock the coconut scare. Because it was radio, you couldn't see anything, so obviously you just made the sounds. Well, television came along, and what did they do? They simply put a camera in the back of these um, theaters where they were doing the radio shows, and they broadcast the radio show. And they still used coconuts, knocking them together, to make horse sounds. It took them 15 years to realize that if they're showing people, they should actually act. It took them 15 years to figure out that if they're talking about a horse, they should show a horse. But they were in the old paradigm. They were thinking of um, a television in the radio paradigm. It took them 15 years to start thinking in terms of the visual paradigm. That's why that explains that first video. Does it look familiar? Lecturing is how faculty have been doing it for hundreds and hundreds of years. 
So what did the uh, major colleges do when online education came out? They stuck a camera in the back of the lecture hall, and they videotaped the lecture. And you couldn't hear well, and you couldn't understand the questions from the audience, and people stood up in front of the camera because they were still thinking in the old paradigm. And what did that publisher do when they came up with an educational video? They ran a PowerPoint presentation, much too fast for anyone to possibly see it or hear it or get anything out of it. But that's what they do at conferences, so we'll do the same thing. So the most important thing to understand is you need to think in the paradigm of the media. This is a visual paradigm. Online education is a visual paradigm. So you have to produce content for the visual paradigm. And uh, that's why the best educational content is coming out outside of higher education, because people outside of higher education already picked up on the visual media. The, ki the kids, literally kids, making a full-time living on YouTube producing videos in their bedrooms and their houses are doing it because they are working within the visual paradigm. They're not working with some other paradigm, they're working in the visual paradigm. So the first lesson is work within the paradigm. And that means, again, copy an expert. Okay? So if you, if you are, for instance, a big football fan, okay, you're a big football fan, you love the NFL, and I tell you, okay, how do you throw a football? And you say, I throw it behind my back. And I say, but do the quarterbacks on TV do that? And they say, no. Well, why are you doing it? You want to throw a football the right way? Watch what the guys on TV do. Do it that way. That's all I'm going to do. All I'm going to do is show you how the people who do it right do and ask you to copy. Okay? So, first off, ask yourself this. Um, how many of you saw, and I guess I can't really ask you out loud because uh, it doesn't have loud microphones. How many of you saw the really wonderful uh, March of the Penguins? Okay, I'm going to say most of you did. If you didn't, you should see it. The documentary March of the Penguins, right? Great. So in that documentary, you had two hours of bullet points while somebody read you the bullet points like you were literate, right? Because that's how you make documentaries. You have two hours of bullet points while people read them to you like you're illiterate, correct? That's how the professionals do it. No, they don't? Then don't do it either. The first rule, no bullet points ever, period. Here's another example. How many people love TED Talks? Love TED Talks? Everyone does. Fantastic. We all love TED Talks. You know what the first rule of TED Talks is? No bullet points, period. Bullet points are treating your audience like they're illiterate. Those are your notes. The notes are for you, not them. Okay? Projecting your bullet points is taking the three by five cards we all had 20 years ago, the old paradigm, and deciding, oh, I'm speaking from somebody, I should project my three by five cards, right? Or I'm on video, I should project my three by five cards. No, that's the, that's the old paradigm, right? Third graders are taught, and I'm serious, and my son was taught this. Third graders were taught how to do uh, talk presentations, live presentations, live videos. First thing they're taught, no bullet points. It's basic. Of course, why would they use bullet points? They weren't confused by the old paradigm, right? They didn't grow up in the three by five cards. It would never occur to them to show you bullet points, right? If they're going to talk about penguin, they show you a penguin. That point doesn't look anything like a penguin. So your average third grader wouldn't even occur to them to use bullet points because they didn't grow up in the old paradigm. They immediately jumped in and used the new paradigm like it's supposed to. So that's what the experts do. One, when you show, do a video, your, your, uh, your voice, your narration tells the story. The imagery amplifies it. You talk about how the penguins do what they do, and you show a penguin. Bullet point doesn't look anything like a penguin. So that's, the, that's what the experts do, and that's one of your first lessons. Second lesson, and this is the, probably the second most important thing you have to remember if you want to produce really good video or produce anything that's educational online. Yeah, exactly. Same with the face-to-face -face presentation. How many people do you go to at a conference, and they turn their back on you, and they read bullet points to you like you're illiterate? If you're just going to read bullet points to people, here's an idea. 
Write them out, hand them out to people, let them go and read them on their own over a cup of coffee. They'll get a lot more out of it. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. What about the great bullet points from that speech? Those, were, those bullet points were really good, weren't they? Right? Or the State of the Union. How about the bullet points from the State of the Union speech? Pretty good, weren't they? So anyways, whether it's face-to-face -face or video, you communicate with your words and your imagery. Second, and this follows from it, your job is to communicate, don't regurgitate. Okay? What's, what this, why, by that, I mean this. Think of, it, think of it this way. Why don't you use a PowerPoint for a marriage proposal? Why would you use PowerPoint for a marriage proposal? Well, it's a joke, right? <laughs> Why would you use PowerPoint? Because PowerPoints are for regurgitating, right? They're just for boring people, right? You don't use right? Marriage proposals are for communicating. Marriage proposals are for t communicating to somebody else that you love them. Marriage proposals are for to get them to understand something and to walk out with an I do, right? Marriage proposals are about communicating. That's why this is how you do a marriage proposal. You don't use a PowerPoint. If you apply the same thinking to your educational content, you'll transform what you do. You're not there to regurgitate. Something that's regurgitated is disgusting and smelly. You're there to communicate. And that's probably the most important thing you want to do when you put together an educational video or any educational content, is simply tell yourself to communicate. That's what the TED Talks do. Communicate. Don't regurgitate. Right? I, the I Have a Dream speech didn't begin with, I'm going to lay out ten reasons why blacks should have equal rights as whites. That's not how they start. That would be regurgitating. The, a good, any kind of good educational content is about communicating. Don't regurgitate. Simple as that. So think about when you go in, how you going to, what you want your audience to walk away with and how you are going to get them to understand that. You're not covering content. Right? There's a, they say, and it's actually been proven, that people can only keep in mind maybe three or four main ideas in their short-term memory, the working memory. If you try to put more in, the extra just leak out. So if you cover 100 points in your talk, they'll walk out with three. If you cover three points in your talk, they'll walk out with three. So don't waste your time trying to cover hundred different points cover the most important ones. Again, when you go in, just think about uh, that simple, always go back to that simple model. Why don't people use PowerPoints for um, marriage proposals? And when you understand why they don't, you will understand what you should be doing when it comes to putting together any educational content. Okay, so using those couple of principles, Let's take a look at some examples. Could we write up the example of digital storytelling? And this is probably the most effective way of producing online uh, content. And I'll show you an example and we'll talk a little bit about it. This is called a digital storytelling method. It's very easy to do, it's very effective. So if you could pull up the digital storytelling example. And while, while we're pulling that up, this is probably your go-to method for producing good educational content. Essentially, you're just combining uh, audio with um, imagery. Simple as that. I have a confession to make. I was wrong. I was wrong. You see, when I left graduate school to become a professor, I thought that teaching was lecturing. After all, that's how my mentors taught. I remember one in particular who would slowly pace back and forth across the stage with his hands behind his back, looking down, only to extend one arm to touch the wall before turning around to pace back. That was my motto of a teacher. But I was wrong. Every study has shown that students learn next to nothing from a lecture. One instructor quizzed students after his lecture and found that only 10% showed any signs of remembering it. While another found that right after his lectures, almost none of the students could answer a question, what was the lecture you just heard about? It turns out that I was in the wrong place. Instead of watching my professors, I should have been in the athletic department watching the coaches. Because the number one influence on student learning is feedback on their work, and coaches teach through feedback. They spend very little time lecturing their athletes. 
They spend most of their time watching their athletes perform and giving them feedback on their performance. But don't college instructors give feedback on student assignments? Well, they grade, but the feedback is unhelpful. Like most instructors, I graded by going down an assignment, mentally subtracting points for each error, and noting the subtractions with margin comments like vague. But that doesn't help the student. The student who sees vague thinks to himself, it's not vague to me, why is it vague to you? By contrast, a coach is fundamentally performance oriented. They're rated by how their athletes perform. And so their feedback is intended to improve the athlete's performance. A coach doesn't tell their player your swing is wrong and walk away. A coach explains why the swing is wrong. You're dropping your back elbow, which causes you to chop at the ball and get no power. Then the coach shows the player the right way to do it. You need to lift your back elbow like this so you can swing through like this. Now you try it. As college instructors, we tell students what they did wrong, but rarely model how to do it right. What I did was just justifying the grade. It's not teaching. Coaches also understand that improvement comes incrementally. HBO's wonderful series Hard Knocks follows an NFL team in training camp, and on one episode it showed a running backs coach speaking to a rookie back before practice. He said to the rookie, what one thing are we going to work on today? To which the rookie replied, ball control. Good, that's what we're going to work on today. Now, this is instructive because a running back doesn't just have one thing to learn. He's got 50 things to learn. But getting him to try to learn them all at once will just overload him. It's like asking someone to remember 50 numbers at once. A coach gives their athlete one thing to focus on at a time so that they can improve in steps. The coach knows that the running back doesn't have to be ready now only four weeks from now when the season starts. When I graded, I tried to list everything that student did wrong with a brief margin comment, as if they were going to fix everything at once. And then I wondered why they are not getting any of it. As an athlete, I also know that the difference between winning and 10th place can come down to motivation alone. And great coaches are not only great teachers, but great motivators. This doesn't mean empty cheerleading. Jerry Kramer once had a bad practice where Vince Lombardi constantly balled him out. In the locker room afterwards, his head was drooping and he was ready to quit. When Lombardi saw this, he came over to Kramer and told him that he could become the best tackle in the league. That gave Kramer a goal and the motivation to achieve it. As teachers, we often demotivate students by only showing them where they fail. We don't tell them that they can succeed if they only follow a plan that we outline for them. Motivation comes from seeing a path to success. So now I teach like a coach giving my students one thing to work on at a time, and a plan for reaching their goals. And that has transformed my teaching and my students. So that is the digital storytelling methodology. It's a very, very simple and very powerful methodology uh, for teaching. And probably the first uh, method you want to go to when producing educational videos. If you noticed, all I did is uh, record a narration and then layered images on top of it. And it's basically produced in two steps. First, you record your narration, essentially what you want to say. Now, you record your narration first rather than your imagery because narration determines pacing. All right? You don't want to pick your imagery first, say, okay, this image is going to go 20 seconds, and I'll just talk for 20 seconds, and then this image will go 30, I'll talk for 30. No, the pacing is determined by your narration. Your images follow. So your first step would be to use something like Audacity and record your narration. Um, I won't go through, and I, I, obviously this isn't a technical um, uh, presentation, so I won't go through how to use something like Audacity. I, I like it my, myself. I, it's my favorite system. But um, you could either... Uh, script out everything and talk your way through. Or what I like to do is I just uh, take some notes and I just talk off notes. And the reason being is it's really hard if you script what you're going to say and uh, speak to a microphone and not sound scripted. I mean, there's a reason why actors make a lot of money, right? Because they can deliver lines and they don't sound like somebody delivering lines. The rest of us can't do that. So I tend not to script out because it tends to sound scripted. Okay, so I tend to just make notes and just record myself in Audacity. The, the second hint I'll give you, especially if you do that, is don't restart every time you make an error because you're going to restart 20 times. 
Right? You're going to restart from start 20 times. It's going to take you forever to get it done. When recording in something like Audacity, simply start the recording, and when you make an error, pause, and then restart, say, from the beginning of the sentence, from the last natural break. So if I say something like, so uh, in, in ancient Greece, Plato had a position that, so in ancient Greece, Aristotle had a position that, notice, I just stopped, paused, and I repeated. Now, when you get done, you can go back in Audacity, and you can simply delete the errors. And once you delete the errors, you get a clean version. And by pausing, you give yourself a flat line to sort of insert the knife. So that's the way I would recommend doing your narration. It goes fairly quickly. You're using notes, uh, just pausing and repeating any line you make a mistake out of, and then deleting out all the errors. Brings it together into a nice audio. And then from there, you're going to layer on the imagery using the video editor. And I realize the term video editor sounds exotic if you've never used it, although I think the people in this, this group probably isn't as exotic to them because you've been you know, using our technologies. But it's actually quite simple. Uh, I use something called Camtasia Studio just because I do some high-level stuff. Uh, that's from TechSmith. But a simple free system is called WeVideo. It's an online system. And all you do is you drop, drop your audio line, as you can see at the bottom there, your audio track, you simply import that, you know, it's literally drag and drop nowadays, into the timeline, the red spot down here. And then as it's playing, I just pick uh, images that will follow what I say. And a lot of times, I don't even know what the image will be until I get to uh, a certain phrase. And I hear the phrase, and then what I literally do is I go out to Google uh, Image Search, Google Advanced Image Search, and I simply type um, a phrase that kind of matches what I'm looking for, like Tour de France. And I'll find Tour de France. And now I'll just go in and go around until I find an image I like. And, you know, you have to respect the uh, copyrights, obviously. There's a way of searching um, permissions so that you get stuff that's only has, uh, you know, free-to-use permissions. So you, you respect the copyrights. And then I just download an image, drop it in there. Uh, it may follow for 20, 30 seconds, and then when I come up with a new point, I go find a new image. It's actually a lot of fun. Uh, the other thing is that use images that are striking. Use images that capture people's attention. Right? The people have a tendency, I think, uh, and this is not just higher education, but uh, they'll use stuff like those um, uh, <laughs> PowerPoint clip art. Don't use PowerPoint clip art. They'll use those, you know, those ugly, ugly little three circles that are supposed to not mean anything. Uh, don't use uh, some of that bad marketing stock art where there's, you know, a bunch of good-looking um, business people, young business people all smiling at the camera or high-fiving, you know. That, don't use any of that. Use something striking. Uh, when I was doing a, a video on um, communication, and at one point, I, to, I made the point that much of communication comes through nonverbal uh, gestures. Well, what I did is I found an image of a, basically a 12-year-old girl who's staring at the camera with this angry kind of dead death look. And then I start talking about how you know, non, a lot of communication is nonverbal. And it, it, it amplified, exemplified the point or it, it showed the point perfectly. And people commented on that. So do something like that. Uh, just find an image that amplifies the point, something striking, something interesting. And when you're done, then you simply export. So that's a digital storytelling format, and uh, it's very, very powerful. Um, I'll briefly go through another one that we all know, the webcam uh, type. So if you could pop up the webcam uh, videos here, and this is one I used to introduce a class. I think it's very good for introducing a class. It kind of humanizes you because people can see your face. You can talk a bit about the class. You can do, say, a two to three minute. So if you could just play this one, I'll just make a few points about what you should be putting in your webcam shots. Hi, I'm John Orlando, your instructor for this course. And yes, there are dinosaurs on the wall. Is there a problem here? This course is on the role of relationships and learning. And here's the idea. Now, I've spent most of my professional career helping faculty move to online teaching. 
And when I first approach faculty about that, invariably I get the objection that once they take their lecture content and put it online, they've given up everything that gives them value to the university. They become superfluous. But I tell them that as a faculty member, their value is not in the knowledge in their head. Because after all, everything you know in your head can be found in some form somewhere, published and free. Students can get that on their own. Your value as a faculty member is in the relationship that you form with your students. That is, the ability to identify what a student has gotten wrong, what they need to be told to improve their performance, and to provide that feedback in a form that gets them from point A to point B because they understand it and accept it. That's the art of teaching, and that's the art of teaching at North Central University. Now, that feedback you give, however, has to be provided within the context of a learning relationship. Because after all, we just simply don't accept feedback from someone that we don't trust or believe in. So establishing a learning relationship is key to teaching because it's key to your getting your students to accept your feedback. That's what we're going to explore. What are some of the things faculty can do to establish a relationship with students? For instance, an introductory video. What are some of the barriers to forming a relationship with students? And how can faculty negotiate these barriers? I think you're going to enjoy this course. So let's get started. Okay, thank you. Like I said, I think a webcam video is a wonderful way to introduce a course. Uh, you can use it for a bio, things like that. Uh, obviously, they're very easy to make. Start your webcam, shoot it, you know, you're done. Um, There's just a few tips to keep in mind uh, when making a really good webcam video. First one, what am I doing right now? Okay. So, like I was saying, I think that you should, I'm talking to your chest, right? This is about the most common mistake people make webcams uh, videos make. They put their notes on their monitor and they read their monitor and they talk to the person's chest. And nobody likes it when we're talking, somebody's talking to our chest, male or female. It makes us, unner makes us nervous. So when you're making a webcam video, make sure you're talking to the camera. That's, that's number one. That's basic. Uh, number two, there's a tendency to drain all the expression out of your voice when you're on camera. Uh, and that's just natural. I mean, once again, it's, there's a reason why network news announcers and uh, actors make so much money. It's a skill not many people have. But you just have to kind of force yourself to have voice inflections to make, thing, make it sound interesting. After all, I mean, you're the, presumably the topic's interesting to you. so. Bring that up. What makes it interesting? Uh, and then this video you saw, it's a few years old. It's not even the best. You know, I've done a little better than that. Um, and then just finally, uh, make sure your sound is pretty good. Uh, I don't like microphones in a webcam for obvious reason that you get feedback. That's one reason. Webcam, uh, obvious, microphones in the laptop especially. Webcam microphones tend not to be so bad. Microphones in the laptop aren't so great. The little pinholes. Uh, webcam microphones aren't so bad, but if you can do a separate microphone, that's good. The other thing is lighting. Don't have backlighting or side lighting because it creates a shadow on your face. And I've literally seen people have made webcam videos where the face was black. They look ghoulish. Literally, it looked like a horror show. So you need to have the light to the front. Usually put in lights out here behind uh, the, the camera. Okay? Those few things, if you keep in mind, you'll make really good videos. All right. Next, uh, how much? Okay, we got some time. I guess we're supposed to go to 90 minutes. Another type of video that you're seeing more and more, and this may sound exotic, is green screen. Okay. The wonderful thing about green screen is, is it's a studio shot, so you can control it. You can control outside noise. You can control the lights. And what you're doing, of course, is you're shooting in front of a green screen, and you can bring in other thing or other things around you as you speak. You can bring in images and things like that. Let's just start. I'll just run maybe a minute or two of this particular video that's in a um, really, really good MOOC on Coursera called Learning How to Learn. Okay, so if we could just run a couple minutes of the Learning How to Learn green screen video. What do you do when you just can't figure something out? For zombies, it's pretty simple. They can just keep bashing their brains against the wall. But living brains are a lot more complex. It turns out, though, that if you understand just a little bit 
of some of the basics about how your brain works, you can learn more easily and be less frustrated. Researchers have found that we have two fundamentally different modes of thinking. Here, I'll call them the focused and the diffuse modes. We're familiar with focusing. It's when you concentrate intently on something you're trying to learn or to understand. But we're not so familiar with diffuse thinking. Turns out that this more relaxed thinking style is related to a set of neural resting states. We're going to use an analogy of the game of pinball to help us understand these two thinking modes. Incidentally, both metaphor and analogy are really helpful when you're trying to learn something new. If you remember, a pinball game works by you pull back on the plunger, release it, and a ball goes boinking out, bouncing around on the rubber bumpers, and that's how you get points. Release it. Okay, can you stop it now? I realize this is an interesting video. You may want to continue watching just because it's interesting. It's a good MOOC. Um, as you can see, it's a very effective way of communicating. We're interested in what she has to say. Uh, we can see her. We can see the imagery around. Now, green screen may sound exotic. It's not hard to make at all. Your school probably has a green screen studio. If they don't, you can literally buy the screen that produces the green screen for about $30. There's a couple of apps that make it very easy. Um, one's called TouchCast. I think they're both iPad apps, TouchCast and Doink. And what they do is they literally allow you to use your iPad to make green screen videos. So all you need is the green screen, which again, you can actually order TouchCast actually as green screen in a box um, that they sell for like $30. So they actually mail you the green screen. They also mail you some stuff to hold lights up. I've never used it, but anyway, so we're talking $30, $40. Put the green screen up, you film it with the iPad, uh, running the iPad through the app, and then when you're done, all the software is right there. It shows you how to eliminate the green screen color and put anything else you want in there. It could be images, it could be videos, it could be text. So all you're doing is that you're filming yourself speaking in front of this green screen. You only have to film yourself a few times, you'll probably make mistakes. And afterwards, the editing is very, very simple. You just choose what else you, you want in the image, in the, in, the, in the view, when you want it. And it just drops it right in. The software does it. Uh, all for you. So again, Doink or TouchPass are very, very simple systems for doing green screen videos, and they're they're very effective for uh, producing online educational content. Um, remember that third video I showed among the group of three, that was done more or less with the green screen at the beginning, and then he just completely switched to digital storytelling and then went back to green screen. But um, it's just really, really not too hard to do. It's, it's something that some colleges are starting to do, and it's something that's very common among the MOOCs. Here's another good sort of lesson about learning how to do it the right way. Uh, find some real good MOOC uh, courses, like learning how to learn. That's a really good one from Coursera. Take a look at what they do. Uh, these are not actors. These are professors. They're both professors from San Diego State. Um, they just basically used uh, some very basic audiovisual uh, systems and made a wonderful, wonderful class. Now we can show, this is the one we showed before, animation. Animation, I think, is a really nice way of especially introducing the class, but also doing lessons. This is a, not really class related. This is uh, something that created, that introduced this, uh, uh, a faculty support group that I created. But we'll run it for about a minute or two. Um, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about animation. As a faculty member, you have many questions about teaching at NCU. What are the training requirements? What are the administrative processes? How to use different technologies in teaching? What are other faculty doing in their teaching? What are the latest developments in the teaching field? And who do you contact for your questions? The Faculty Resource Center Comments site serves as your hub for teaching questions. Here you'll find information on teaching requirements, processes, and policies. You'll also find the Teacher Talk forum for discussing teaching issues with your fellow faculty members. You'll find resources shared by fellow faculty that will save you time and help you teach more effectively. You'll also find updates from the field, including good journal articles, conferences, websites, and the webinars that have been offered by the Faculty Resource Center. And finally, you'll find information about us, 
who to contact in the Faculty Resource Center with your questions. Come take a look around and use this resource to develop your teaching skills, discuss teaching issues with fellow faculty, and keep up to date on new developments in teaching at NCU. Okay, okay thank you. Um, in the last few years, a number of animation apps have popped up that make animation very, very easy. Now, it's not going to look like Pixar, of course, but um, they actually do do a fairly good job using some basic motions. Now, that one I particularly like. It's called Paw Tune. Uh, another common one is Video Scribe. Those are probably the, the two biggest ones on the market. And they use a similar way of doing. Sometimes it's called RSA Animate, where you can actually type in uh, what you want to appear on the screen in, in terms of text, like the title of our um, Faculty Resource Center, and a hand will come out and actually write it for you. You can put in an image, by the way. Um, I believe it has to be a GIF image, uh, and it will sketch the image for you. Literally, it will sketch out the image. Um, it does a pretty good job. Um, and, of course, you can just put uh, images as well that the hand will just bring in. If you don't want the, the hand to bring it in, you can just have them fly in, fly out. Um, and separately, you uh, record narration. So it's really similar to digital storytelling. You just record the narration, then you grab whatever uh, images you want coming in, whatever else you want to show, and then you go to the website and just put it all together. Uh, then it uses, like most systems, it uses the freemium uh, pricing model. If you want it for free, you'll get the little logo at the bottom left, like you see there. If you want to pay more, and it could be anywhere from, I don't know, $50 a year, maybe less, actually 50 is probably on the high side, maybe $25 a year, up to 50 then you don't have to worry about the logo, you get better definition, stuff like that. So it might be worth you know, spending a little more money. But um, this is, seems to be a nice... Uh, effective way of, once again, maybe introducing a class, introducing a concept, something like that. Um, it just captures our attention. And do remember that the most important thing, maybe not most important, but one of the most important things in communication is capturing your audience's attention. Okay? A lot of speakers, most speakers don't realize that, that capturing your audience's attention is the first thing you have to do. Uh, then after that, everything else is easy. But uh, something like this is a very, very, very simple way of capturing your audience's attention using um, stuff that's very, very easy to learn. So that's a, another method for making good videos. And again, use images that are striking. Use images that are, are ironic. Uh, when I, uh, and maybe you don't think they're great. You know, maybe they're not great. I just playing around with it. But when it came to stuff like who do you when I said, who do you call for questions, I found an image of an old, um, I think the very first telephone ever made from like 1880 or something like that, right? So instead of showing some, you know, good-looking business person on a phone, I showed an old image of the telephone, okay? Maybe a little ironic or something, but something like that, something that's just a little, a little interesting, okay? And it keeps our attention. Um, I'm going to go through uh, one or two more uh, different possibilities. And again, mostly here, I think I'm just kind of opening your mind to the options. Another one is stop motion. And stop motion is basically where you have uh, a camera in one place that records what's going on in front of it, like on a desk or something like that. And then you simply either speed it up or it's taking a picture every two seconds or a half second and you stitch them all together. So first I want to show you an example, and let's, we, I'd like to play through this entire example. It's really good. So turn your, turn your speakers up if you haven't done that before. You're really going to like the stop motion example. Okay? So this is a hexaflexagon example. Okay? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it. So say you just moved from England to the U.S. and you got your old school supplies from England and your new school supplies from the U.S. and it's your first day of school and you get to class and find that your new American paper doesn't fit in your old English binder. The paper is too wide and hangs out. So you cut off the extra and end up with all these strips of paper. And to keep yourself amused during your math class, you start playing with them. And by you, I mean Arthur H. Stone in 1939. 
Anyway, there's lots of cool things you can do with a strip of paper. You can fold it into shapes and more shapes. Maybe spiral it around snugly like this. Maybe make it into a square. Maybe wrap it into a hexagon with a nice symmetric sort of cycle to the flappy parts. In fact, there's enough space here to keep wrapping the strip, and then your hexagon is pretty stable. And you're like, I don't know, hexagons aren't too exciting, but I guess it has symmetry or something. Maybe you could kind of fold it so the flappy parts are down and the unflappy parts are up. That's symmetric, and it collapses down into these three triangles, which collapse down into one triangle. And collapsible hexagons are, you suppose, cool enough to at least amuse you a little bit during your class. And then, since hexagons have six-way symmetry, you decide to try this three-way fold the other way, with flappy parts up, and are collapsing it down when suddenly the inside of your hexagon decides to open right up. What? You close it back up and undo it. Everything seems the same as before. The center is not open upable. But when you fold it that way again, it like flips inside out. Weird. This time instead of going backwards, you try doing it again, and again, and again, and... You want to make one that's a little less messy, so you try again with another strip and tape it nicely into a twisty foldy loop. You decide it would be cool to color the side, so you get out a highlighter and make one yellow. Now you can flip from yellow side to white side. Yellow side, white side, yellow side, white side, yep. Hmm. White side? What? Where did the yellow side go? So you go back, and this time you color a white side green, and find that your piece of paper has three sides, yellow, white, and green. Now this thing is definitely cool, therefore you need to name it, and since it's shaped like a hexagon, and you flex it, and flex rhymes with hex, hexaflexagon it is. That night, you can't sleep because you keep thinking about hexaflexagons, and the next day, as soon as you get to your math class, you pull out your paper strips. You'd made this sort of spirally folded paper that folds into, again, the shape of a piece of paper, and you decide to take that and use it like a strip of paper to make a hexaflexagon, which should totally work, but it feels sturdier with the extra paper. And you color the three sides and are like, orange, yellow, pink, orange, yellow, pink. And you're sort of trying to pay attention to class, math, yeah, orange, yellow, pink, orange, yellow, white? Wait a second. Okay, so you color that one green, and now it's orange, yellow, green, orange, yellow, green, who knows where the pink side went. Oh, there it is! Now it's back to orange, yellow, pink, orange, yellow, pink, hmm, blue. Yellow, pink, blue, yellow, pink, blue, yellow, pink, blue, yellow, pink, huh. With the old flexagon, you could only flex it one way, flappy way up. But now there's more flaps, so maybe you can fold it both ways. Yes, one goes from pink to blue, but the other from pink to orange. And now one way goes from orange to yellow, but the other way goes from orange to neon yellow. During lunch, you want to show it off to one of your new friends, Bryant Tuckerman. You start with the original simple three-faced hexaflexagon, which you call the trihexaflexagon. And he's like, whoa, and wants to learn how to make one. And you're like, it's easy to start with a paper strip. Fold it into equilateral triangles, and you'll need nine of them, and you fold them around into this cycle and make sure it's all symmetric. Like, the flat parts are diamonds, and if they're not, then you're doing it wrong. And then you just tape the first triangle to the last along the edge, and you're good. But Tuckerman doesn't have tape, after all, it was invented only ten years ago. So he cuts out ten triangles instead of nine, and then glues the first to the last. Then you show him how to flex it by pinching around a flappy part and pushing it on the opposite side to make it flat and triangly, and then opening from the center. You decide to start a flexagon committee together to explore the mysteries of flexigation. But that will have to wait until next time. Okay, that used stop motion. And the, uh, the props, or the total equipment, was one uh, iPad with possibly free software, either something like Coma Coma, K-O-M-A, K-O-M-A, or Jelly Cam, uh, simply hung above a table, and somebody simply moving their hands. And then you add the narration later. And the thing to keep in mind is, how many of you find geog geography? Geometry, I'm sorry, geometry inherently interesting. My guess is not many. I'm not saying it isn't, but not many. Now, how many of you found the video interesting? My guess is everybody. So look at what you can do. Simply by deciding I'm going to communicate, I'm going to grab your attention, I'm going to make this interesting, you make something interesting that may not have been interesting, that most people would not think is interesting if you just stood up there and simply regurgitated information about hexagons and stuff like that. So something like stop motion could be a wonderful way to introduce a lesson. Um, if you want to, uh, say, uh, capture the student's attention, think about some aspect of it that's interesting. You know, obviously, if it's like a 
physics course or something like that, instead of getting straight into certain laws of physics, you might start with some interesting fact about the universe or things like that. And uh, a simple video like this, quite literally, shot on a kitchen table, shot on a desk, um, with software that's either free or very, very inexpensive, uh, is a very, very effective way of doing that. So uh, that's probably another example. I was, I mean, I may actually get closer to uh, the end, and I'm going to open it up to questions. I had one other. If we have time, I'm going to show you one more example. But I'm going to repeat what I said before. I mean, basically, I'm not what I would consider a trained expert in producing videos. All I did is I simply watched what the experts did, and I did that. I copied them. If they do it in TED Talks, I did it. If they don't do it in TED Talks, I don't do it. If they do it in documentaries, really good documentaries, I did it. If they don't do it in really good documentaries, I didn't do it. So basically, a good way of simply learning how to produce good educational content is go to the people who are producing good educational content. And by that, I don't mean what your teachers taught you about lecturing 30 years ago. I mean the people that when you look at it, say, wow, I can remember, I can repeat what I just learned. Of those first three videos I showed you, how many of you can repeat the first two? Meanwhile, how many of you can tell, talk about what the door to hell was? Right? So find examples of really good quality and simply do that, simply copy. And I want to leave you with one more thought, and that's that having fun is a very effective way of learning. If you can add some kind of fun to it, some kind of lightness, you will help ingrain the message in the learner's mind. And with this, if you could, and here's the one that you actually tried to show the last time, but this is the other hexaflexagon video, and this is a um, one I want to kind of leave you with, and we can ask questions. Hexaflexagons. They're cool, hip, and hexa fun to play with, right? Wrong. Hexaflexagons are not toys. With the increasing number of hexaflexagons finding their way into homes and schools, it's important to be aware of proper flexigation regulations when engaging in flexagon construction and use. Taking proper precautions can help avoid a flexi catastrophe. Do not wear loose clothing when engaging in flexigation. If you have long hair, tie it back so it doesn't get caught in a flexigation device. Ties are also a common source of incidents. Stay alert. Never flexigate while under the influence. When using a hexaflexagon, sudden unexpected sides may appear, and drugs like alcohol can slow re reaction time. If you aren't sure what kind of flexagon you're dealing with, it's safer to temporarily disable the flexagon. Flexagons can be disarmed by using scissors to cut them apart. You can cut across the original seam where the paper strip was taped together, which may appear on the edge or through the face of the flexagon. In an emergency, however, flexagons can be cut apart right through a triangle, or on three edges if you want to retain symmetry, or into nine separate triangles if you really want to be safe. You can even cut them in half down the length of the paper strip like this, into two separate, um, two separate once you've cut your flexagon apart, you can figure out what kind it is. If it has nine triangles, that's 18 triangle sides. So at six triangles per hexagon side, that's three sides, a trihexaflexagon. Note that some flexagons might be made from a double strip of triangles that have been folded in half so that marker doesn't bleed through. Don't let yourself be fooled by the extra triangles. Avoid danger during hexaflexagon construction. If you're not working from a printed pattern, you might start your flexagon by picking a point on the edge of a strip of paper, folding that 180 degree angle into thirds to create three 60 degree angles, and then using the equilateral triangle that results as a guide to fold the rest of the strip of paper, zigzagging back and forth. Without proper attention and focus, this could easily lead to becoming unreasonably amused with the springy spring of happy triangles that results. Always keep your hexaflexagon in good working order. Pre-creasing all the triangles both ways before configuring them into hexaflexagonal formation will help your flexagon operate properly and avoid accidents. Keep a close watch on the chirality of your hexaflexagon, that is, whether it is right or left-handed. Notice how in this hexaflexagon, water flows clockwise down under the flaps, even if you flip it over or flex it, while in this hexaflexagon it flows counterclockwise, they're mirror images. The chirality is decided when you fold and tape your triangles into a twisty loop, and when once taped, it is impossible to change from one to the other without cutting it apart, at least in three-dimensional Euclidean space. A change in chirality could be a sign that your flexagon has been flipped through four-dimensional space and is possibly a highly dangerous multi-dimensional portal. 
With experience, a hexaflexagon master can construct a hexaflexagon in mere seconds. Some forego tape and scissors entirely by folding a double strip that's too long and tucking the extra in. This is an advanced technique that should not be attempted without prior training. Beware topological changes. This family seems safe from this velociraptor because they live on separate planets with the cold empty vacuum of space between them, but after a single flex, the unfortunate victims are now doomed, protected only by the inconsequential barrier of their domicile. Your stars might explode, your frowns may become smiles, your most pointy of triangles might become the roundest of circles, perfectly healthy snakes may turn into snake loops, or worse, become decapitated. Either state is fatal for the snake, as having no head can lead to starvation. This can be avoided by simply marking where connections will be across neighboring triangles first. Afterwards, the lines can be filled in however you like. Be aware that with the trihexaflexagon, there are two variations to each face, so you can simply draw one side where triangles connect and flip and draw the other. But in the in the hexahexaflexagon, the main three faces each appear four different ways. If you use hexaflexagons, keep an eye out for signs of dependency. Overuse can lead to addiction and possibly an overdose. Some users of hexaflexagons report confusion, mind blown syndrome, hexaflexaperplexia, hexaflexadyslexia, hexaflexaperfectionism, and hexaflexamexican food cravings. If you find yourself experiencing any of these symptoms, stop flexagon use immediately and see the head of your math department. With proper precautions, flexigating can be a great part of your life. Follow these simple safety guidelines and you should be ready for a fun and safe hexaflexagon experience. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, the, the point, I hope again, I hope you picked up the fact that uh, there are actually two or three different important learning things, chirality of hexaflexagons and other points you picked up through that video without even knowing it. <laughs> uh, these are all, like I said, relatively simple devices. And yeah, it's going to take practice. The first time you do it, it's not going to look this good. And it's, you know, it's going to look like the first time you did it. But um, just just try different things. Try different options. Have your students do it. I actually gave students an assignment where they had to produce a digital uh, teaching um, module, a module that uh, taught something related to the class online. And some of them used animation to do it. Some of them um, used, a lot of them used digital storytelling. Um, I put it on a class wiki. I told them they needed an assessment. So I also, uh, so I showed them some assessment uh, devices. So they put up usually simple quizzes, something like that. Um, and their classmates had to go through the module uh, and have to, when they were done, do the assessment. So you could even have your students produce some stuff. And if it looks good, you don't just use it in class. <laughs> so um, that's basically my, uh, my message to you, is that there's a lot of different options out there. And unfortunately, 95% of the academic world just defaults into lecturing or reading bullet points to somebody like they're uh, illiterate. But there's a lot, there are a lot of wonderful options out there. And I hope you can see from these examples, comparing these options to other options and asking you what you think was a better educational mechanism, you'll see that using the visual medium to your benefit is the way to produce you know, learning, is the way to produce learning outcomes. So just going to give you a few ideas, some, some thoughts on where to get started. If you have uh, some questions, I guess we have a few minutes, um, have some questions. If you don't have any, I got one more short video that you're really going to like. But if you don't have uh, any questions, uh, so some people are typing here. Let's see here. Oh, macanemia. You know, it's funny. Um, I've never tried it, but it's funny you bring that up. I, I think I mentioned to you that there are numerous people making a full-time living on YouTube producing their own YouTube videos. Uh, a guy by the name of Ray Johnson, um, he actually quit doing it uh, about a year ago. But when he quit, he had over, I think, 3 billion, that's billion with a B, views on his videos. And these are basically videos he was shooting in his own living room. Um, uh, and there's probably about a couple hundred people who are making a living doing that. I bring that up because um, a couple years ago, uh, we were sitting around after uh, dinner once. I think it was over Easter or something like that. And uh, everyone was sort of showing, all the kids were kind of showing what they did. And one, uh, my, my wife's son's 
girlfriend showed this uh, YouTube channel she created, which was on um, beauty aids for high school girls, because she's in high school. And she had like a few thousand subscribers and maybe 100,000 views. And every couple days, she puts together this video. And then my wife's son, who I think was still in high school at that time, decided to show a video he had made using uh, Makina, Mac I think it is. I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. And uh, it was a short animated video. It was about three or four minutes long. And it had two million views at that point. Two million. Now, it's interesting. I was working for an insurance company at that time that had a YouTube account. And they had professionals producing the videos. Total views of all their videos add up to 50,000. Meanwhile, my wife's son, who produced this video on his own without any training, had two million. Um, so unfortunately, I don't, I don't, I've never used that form. I could ask him how to use it. I know it's not hard to learn, but I think that's a good, I, I'm, the reason I gave you this kind of this detour is just to show you what a difference it makes when you start, uh, you know, using these, these formats and uh, how they interest people and how they, how they get people exciting. Yeah, if you monetize, it's interesting. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> Okay, and then both of them could talk about monetization. It turns out YouTube, uh, the, their formula is actually a secret. You have to sign a contract that says um, you can't tell what the formula is for monetizing. So they said it's a very, very complex formula. But I think they said about $1,000 per million views was about average, most people say. But it's actually a complex formula. But you can, uh, uh, okay, so $1.37 per 1,000 views, yeah. And it's apparently, it has a lot to do with, like, secondary views and how often people watch to the end. It's, you know, it's, it's Google because so they've got it very complex and connected to marketers. But I was just giving you sort of a uh, rough guess. Um, so, yeah, that's why people can make full-time living uh, doing this stuff, um, just producing it on their own, you know. And this stuff is being you know, seen by more people than the people who are producing the, you know, professional marketer stuff because no one wants to see a marketer's stuff. Uh, YouTube Red, yeah, it's interesting. I haven't, uh, I, my YouTube channel, I keep getting that banner, do you want to switch to YouTube Red? I haven't done that. Uh, I think that shows, I think it shows ads right in the middle of your video or something like that. I'll have to check on that. Um, uh, yeah, dogs and cats get the most views, yeah. Oh, there are no ads on, oh, is it because you pay a subscription price and then you don't get ads? Okay, so that's what the difference is. You probably pay a subscription and you don't get ads. That's my guess is the difference or something like that. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. I'll we'll have to take a look at that. Any other questions or thoughts? We've got a few people typing here. I have to use my, move my chat box up. For some reason my chat box is real small. Oh, uh, choice of what type of ad you want to run. Topics and where the ads appear. Oh, okay, I see. I see. That's interesting. Yeah, I did, I actually haven't. Um, my vid, my, I mean, my uh, videos aren't don't get that many views. I haven't monetized. Uh, I guess I could, but I think I'd like make a few bucks. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd make enough money. So, <laughs> Professor Puppet. Uh, if it, if you got, by the way, if you want to hang around. <laughs> Can we show, I'm just curious about something here. Let me just take a second. Would we be able to uh, show a video if I gave you a link to it? I think this is one you're really going to like. It's one more different option here. You have to just give me a second to pull it off. I have it on Daigo here. I just put a uh, link in the chat box. Would you be able to put that in there? That's one more example of an excellent educational video. So if you have a couple minutes, I think you're going to enjoy this. It has to do with music education and why it matters. This is from YouTube. I get tired of people talking about how band, in particular, is easy. It is not easy. It's my feeling that sometimes we've got our, our priorities out of whack. As much as I love sports, I sometimes think in our school systems, sports take precedence over academics. 
And where sports are important for a lot of factors, they're not as hard as it is to be in band. You know, I was thinking about a good batting average. It's 300. That's 30%. If we played 30%, how would that sound? <laughs> and in football, you actually get a chance. There's built-in failures, right? They call it an incomplete pass. We can't have an incomplete B-flat. <laughs> and we don't get three chances to play it, and then we can't punt in the middle of a piece. <laughs> Now granted, granted, the difference is we don't have anyone trying to stop us from playing. <gasps> so you do have that in, in a, con a sports contest. But let's go to academics for a minute. You have to realize that music is one of the few things these students do that uses both sides of the brain. The left side of the brain is dealing with all the technical stuff. You see, they're reading a foreign language. So this really develops language skills and reading skills because they're reading a foreign language. Hola, mi amigo. ¿Cómo está? What's going on here? Ich bin ein Berliner. I am a Frenchman from Paris. They're turning this code into what someone once told me. They're turning something that's black and white and making it into beautiful colors. And we're going to put some happy little trees right over here by the mountains. Yeah, that's nice. That's one thing they do. The other technical side, they're dividing. They're doing math the whole time. How long does this note? The durations are all fractional. Huh? What? They're dealing with that all the time. They're dealing with the technical aspects of their instruments. What fingers to put down. Also, how their embouchure is shaped to make the sound. <laughs> Much more than that, they're hearing if they're playing in tune or not. <laughs> eh? Are they playing in the right style? In other words, are they playing the notes short enough, long enough, connected enough, loud enough, soft enough? Now, we're not even going to deal with all those aspects. We're going to deal with one aspect, right and wrong. So what we're going to do for you is demonstrate what the band would sound like on a small passage if we were operating somewhere between 90 and 95 percent. Because of the odd number of notes, some of them are, are actually above 95, some of them are around 90. But we're going to play for you just a section of Shenandoah with my great apologies to Frank to Kelly. We're going to play a short section. First we'll play it for you correctly. And then we'll play it for you at 95 or so percent, which in most academic classes is an A. Okay, so here's Shenandoah correctly. And that would get you an A. <laughs> you see, music demands perfection. Now, we don't always get there. In fact, seldom do we get there. But it's the one few things in their lives that demands that they be perfect. 
So what you heard was 146 mistakes. No one really made more than one mistake. But 146 happening at a 94 percentile. This is so important, ladies and gentlemen. And you can't let someone who doesn't know about music take music out of our schools. Yeah, he's right, baby. So you've got to realize, parents, they won't listen to us teachers. They think we just want to keep a job. They'll listen to you. Once again, I think the good way of putting it is that's communicating. Uh, and it goes right back to distinction. Are you regurgitating or are you communicating? He wanted to communicate one simple message, and he came up with a way to do that. So that's, that's the art thing to always keep in mind. Whenever you're creating educational content, always communicate, never regurgitate. So with that, I've uh, outlived or out uh, lasted my uh, stay. So I want to thank you uh, for spending this time with me. Thanks a lot. Bye.